The Desire of Ages, Chapter 83, The Walk to Emmaus Late in the afternoon of the day of the resurrection, two of the disciples were on their way to Emmaus, a little town eight miles from Jerusalem. These disciples had had no prominent place in Christ's work, but they were earnest believers in him. They had come to the city to keep the Passover and were greatly perplexed by the events that had recently taken place. They had heard the news of the mourning in regard to the removal of Christ's body from the tomb, and also the report of the women who had seen the angels and had met Jesus. They were now returning to their homes to meditate and pray. Sadly, they pursued their evening walk, talking over the scenes of the trial and the crucifixion. Never before had they been so utterly disheartened. Hopeless and faithless, they were walking in the shadow of the cross. They had not advanced far on their journey when they were joined by a stranger, but they were so absorbed in their gloom and disappointment that they did not observe him closely. They continued their conversation, expressing the thoughts of their hearts. They were reasoning in regard to the lessons that Christ had given, which they seemed unable to comprehend. As they talked of the events that had taken place, Jesus longed to comfort them. He had seen their grief. He understood the conflicting, perplexing ideas that brought to their minds the thought, can this man, who suffered himself to be so humiliated, be the Christ? Their grief could not be restrained, and they wept. Jesus knew that their hearts were bound up with him in love, and he longed to wipe away their tears and fill them with joy and gladness. But he must first give them lessons they would never forget. He said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? They told him of their disappointment in regard to their master, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. But the chief priests and our rulers, they said, delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. With hearts sore with disappointment and with quivering lips they added, We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Strange that the disciples did not remember Christ's words and realize that he had foretold the events which had come to pass. They did not realize that the last part of his disclosure would be just as verily fulfilled as the first part, that the third day he would rise again. This was the part they should have remembered. The priests and rulers did not forget this. On the day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. But the disciples did not remember these words. Then he said unto them, O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? The disciples wondered who this stranger could be that he should penetrate to their very souls and speak with such earnestness tenderness and sympathy, and with such hopefulness. For the first time since Christ's betrayal, they began to feel hopeful. Often they looked earnestly at their companion and thought that his words were just the words that Christ would have spoken. They were filled with amazement and their hearts began to throb with joyful expectation. Beginning at Moses, the very Alpha of Bible history, Christ expounded in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Had he first made himself known to them, their hearts would have been satisfied. In the fullness of their joy, they would have hungered for nothing more. But it was necessary for them to understand the witness borne to him by the types and prophecies of the Old Testament. 
Upon these their faith must be established. Christ performed no miracle to convince them, but it was his first work to explain the scriptures. They had looked upon his death as the destruction of all their hopes. Now he showed from the prophets that this was the very strongest evidence for their faith. In teaching these disciples, Jesus showed the importance of the Old Testament as a witness to his mission. Many professed Christians now discard the Old Testament, claiming that it is no longer of any use. But such is not Christ's teaching. So highly did he value it, that at one time he said, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. It is the voice of Christ that speaks through patriarchs and prophets from the days of Adam, even to the closing scenes of time. The Saviour is revealed in the Old Testament as clearly as in the New. It is the light from the prophetic past that brings out the life of Christ and the teachings of the New Testament with clearness and beauty. The miracles of Christ are a proof of His divinity, but a stronger proof that He is the world's Redeemer is found in comparing the prophecies of the Old Testament with the history of the New. Reasoning from prophecy, Christ gave His disciples a correct understanding of what He was to be in humanity. Their expectation of a Messiah who was to take His throne and kingly power in accordance with the desires of men had been misleading. It would interfere with a correct apprehension of His descent from the highest to the lowest position that could be occupied. Christ desired that the ideas of his disciples might be pure and true in every specification. They must understand as far as possible in regard to the cup of suffering that had been apportioned to him. He showed them that the awful conflict which they could not yet comprehend was the fulfillment of the covenant made before the foundation of the world was laid. Christ must die as every transgressor of the law must die if he continues in sin. All this was to be, but it was not to end in defeat, but in glorious, eternal victory. Christ told them that every effort must be made to save the world from sin. His followers must live as he lived and work as he worked with intense, persevering effort. Thus Christ discoursed to his disciples, opening their minds that they might understand the scriptures. The disciples were weary, but the conversation did not flag. Words of life and assurance fell from the Saviour's lips, but still their eyes were holding. As he told them of the overthrow of Jerusalem, they looked upon the doomed city with weeping, but little did they yet suspect who their travelling companion was. They did not think that the subject of their conversation was walking by their side, for Christ referred to himself as though he were another person. They thought that he was one of those who had been in attendance at the great feast and who was now returning to his home. He walked as carefully as they over the rough stones, now and then halting with them for a little rest. Thus they proceeded along the mountainous road while the one who was soon to take his position at God's right hand, and who could say, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, walked beside them. During the journey the sun had gone down, and before the travellers reached their place of rest, the labourers in the fields had left their work. As the disciples were about to enter their home, the stranger appeared as though he would continue his journey. But the disciples felt drawn to him. Their souls hungered to hear more from him. Abide with us, they said. He did not seem to accept the invitation, but they pressed it upon him, urging, It is toward evening, and the day is far spent. Christ yielded to this entreaty and went in to tarry with them. Had the disciples failed to press their invitation, they would not have known that their travelling companion was the risen Lord. Christ never forces his company upon anyone. 
He interests himself in those who need him. Gladly will he enter the humblest home and cheer the lowliest heart. But if men are too indifferent to think of the heavenly guest, or ask him to abide with them, he passes on. Thus many meet with great loss. They do not know Christ any more than did the disciples as he walked with them by the way. The simple evening meal of bread is soon prepared. It is placed before the guest who has taken his seat at the head of the table. Now he puts forth his hands to bless the food. The disciples start back in astonishment. Their companion spreads forth his hands in exactly the same way as their master used to do. They look again and lo, they see in his hands the print of nails. Both exclaim at once, it is the Lord Jesus. He has risen from the dead. They rise to cast themselves at his feet and worship him, but he has vanished out of their sight. They look at the place which has been occupied by the one whose body had lately lain in the grave and say to each other, Did not our heart burn within us while he walked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? But with this great news to communicate, they cannot sit and talk. Their weariness and hunger are gone. They leave their meal untasted and full of joy immediately set out again on the same path by which they came, hurrying to tell the tidings to the disciples in the city. In some parts the road is not safe, but they climb over the steep places, slipping on the smooth rocks. They do not see, they do not know that they have the protection of him who has traveled the road with them. With their pilgrim staff in hand, they press on, desiring to go faster than they dare. They lose their track, but find it again. Sometimes running, sometimes stumbling, they press forward, their unseen companion close beside them all the way. The night is dark, but the sun of righteousness is shining upon them. Their hearts leap for joy. They seem to be in a new world. Christ is a living Savior. They no longer mourn over him as dead. Christ is risen. Over and over again they repeat it. This is the message they are carrying to the sorrowing ones. They must tell them the wonderful story of the walk to Emmaus. They must tell who joined them by the way. They carry the greatest message ever given to the world. A message of glad tidings upon which the hopes of the human family for time and for eternity.